there. Uh, we're going to jump right into Acts chapter 13. So if you have a Bible, you can open them up. Uh, it also appears if you have a seat near you, I, I won't say raise your hand, but we, we do have people looking for seats, so especially if it's easy for you to uh, cuddle in close with somebody near you, that would be great. I don't think I'm asking you to share a seat with somebody. I think just eliminate the gap seats. So uh, no lap sitting necessary. All right. Uh, Acts chapter 13 is an amazing moment in the book of Acts. See, we're at, the, we're at the point where the gospel gets on a boat. And that might not seem like a big deal, but when you think about the, uh, the technology of the day, uh, their boats were the way that they would travel to the far parts of the world. As far as they could get to, they would travel by boat. Right now, we can get on planes. In fact, as Bert mentioned, uh, in just a couple weeks, around 50 or actually around 60 of us from Anthem Church are getting on planes to go to Albania to be a part of a global gathering of churches uh, that are working together to plant churches into the nation. So it's a, it's a unique opportunity and one that, uh, you know, even back in the first century would have taken weeks on weeks on weeks for a group of people to travel across the world to get to Albania. But we have this technology, we have planes. And here in Acts chapter 13, they had boats. And Paul and Barnabas will make a point to use those boats to take the gospel to the far corners of the earth. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at Acts chapter 13 and talk about how the gospel goes out. As we look at this chapter, it gives us insight into how the gospel moves. And we want to take a look at what that looks like in their world and in ours. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to read through. It's a long section, Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 52. Uh, so I suggest having it in front of you, but we will have it up on the screen behind me if you don't happen to have your Bible with you. So it says this, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a member of the court of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. That's quite a resume a Jewish false prophet magician named Bar-Jesus, which uh, uh, Bar-Jesus is not connected to actual Jesus Christ. That's just a common name like John or Mike, uh, but his name was Bar-Jesus or son of Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, that's the same as Bar-Jesus, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And in case you're wondering, this is a different Antioch. Uh, there is a key Greek leader named Antiochus Epiphanes. There are a lot of towns named after him, so there are two Antiochs. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hands said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. 
And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, what do you suppose that I am? Am I not he? No. But behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb, but God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. And they went out, and the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And and Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited devout women of high standing, and leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we just ask for your grace. And as we look into this amazing text, Lord, it would shape our understanding of the gospel and how it moves. We love you, Lord, and we praise you in your name. Amen. All right, so one of the first things that we notice as Luke writes this section is his emphasis on team. If you were with us last week, I taught verses 1 through 4, and I added those in again this week. And they are there because I wanted to show you just the nature of the the leadership team at Antioch. We have Paul and Barnabas and Manan and Simeon and Lucius, this group of people. And then the Holy Spirit says something. He says, set apart for me. Paul and Barnabas for the work to which I've called them. So right away we have this this moment where there's a a sending of two of the five of the leadership team, calling them out and sending them out. And what's interesting is that Paul and Barnabas, they receive this assignment from the Holy Spirit and they instantly go. 
But on their first trip, they sail actually to Barnabas' hometown of Cyprus. They go there, and they have a guy named John that's there to assist them. And they brought this young man named John Mark into the story. Now, John Mark has an, an interesting story, and we'll get to know it a little bit throughout the book of Acts. Uh, in this moment, John Mark joins up with Paul and Barnabas for a brief moment as they do ministry on the island of Cyprus. They face some persecution, and while Luke doesn't throw him under the bus and say he was afraid or anything, after that moment, he heads back to Jerusalem, and Paul and Barnabas keep going. Now, we learn later that Paul was pretty disappointed that John Mark took off on them. There's a time later that uh, Barnabas will want to bring John Mark on another one of their missionary journeys, on another one of their adventures to go plant churches. And Paul's like, no, this guy bailed on us. We are not taking him with us. And Barnabas decides at that point to split off from Paul and take John Mark with him instead of continuing on with Paul. That's how dedicated Barnabas is to raising up this young man, John Mark. Now, we'll get into that in time, but I wanted, to, I wanted to focus on this. There's an assignment that's given to Paul and Barnabas, and we learn that that assignment is to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And they go, and they start preaching, and they do go to the synagogues first, but they go and preach the gospel all over the Mediterranean. That assignment is given to them, but there's a commitment in Paul and Barnabas to raising up apprentices everywhere they go. Everywhere they go. It starts with John Mark. This is an interesting moment because John Mark becomes a part of this team. And then we actually see that he goes on to minister with Barnabas. He will eventually connect with Peter. And this is the man that writes the gospel of Mark. So in this moment, as Paul and Barnabas take him on this journey, this first moment, and his life sort of begins with a failure or a running away his story is redeemed, and he eventually goes on to become a significant disciple and a part of the story of God. Now, we'll get into a lot of these names, but I just want to show you a, a short list of some of the names of people that Paul and Barnabas will bring with them at times. John Mark, Timothy, Silas, Titus, Aristarchus, Jason, Sopater, Onesimus, Luke, Trophimus, Epaphras, Gaius, Tychicus, the list actually goes on. There's even more out there. Phoebe and Priscilla and Aquila and Apollos. There is a practice on the part of Paul and Barnabas to bring in the next generation of leader, to train them up, and to prepare them for what is next. And this ministry gets extended in ways that go way beyond what Paul and Barnabas are able to do. Timothy will end up leading the Ephesian church. Titus gets left in Crete to put what remains into order. Paul asks Titus to stay in Crete and start putting elders into all the different churches functioning apostolically on that island. Uh, we see Phoebe as a, a messenger taking the book of Romans to the Roman church and reading it on behalf of those people. We see Priscilla and Aquila brought into the story and Apollos brought into the story. This is what Paul and Barnabas do. Now, why is this so important? Some of you have been given assignments by God. Things that uh, are, have been placed on your life. I have this heart to go and reach this people group. Uh, the Lord's asked me to minister in this way. One of my encouragements, encouragements to you is if you have been given assignment, do not treat that as yours alone. It is in the DNA of the way of Jesus to take the things that have been entrusted to us and to bring other people into those stories. Whatever God is asking of you, he's not just asking you to do it, he's asking it to go through you and to start bringing other people into the story. Now, what you don't know and what you can't control is that whomever you bring into your story, they may not be there to take over for you, but they may be in training for whatever the story is that God's writing in their life. And that happens with Paul and Barnabas all over the place. They'll see people come into their story for a brief moment and then step out into the great stories that God is writing in their life. And so what we learn from this is that the gospel goes out in team. It goes out in team. The gospel was never meant to be a one-man show, one person 
going off and doing their thing. And if you looked at the Apostle Paul's life and say he was one guy that was taking the gospel to the very ends of the earth, you would be absolutely wrong and you should go back and reread the New Testament because every single one of Paul's letters says at the very end of it, and by the way, how many of you, when you're reading your Bible, you scan over the, the names read at the end of one of the letters? Stop doing it. It's probably my favorite part of these letters because it's Paul saying, this person is involved, and this person is involved, and this person is involved, and they're a part of the story, and God is doing great work in them to advance the gospel, and that's how this works. That's how this works. So when you go, you bring. When you say yes to what is God is asking of you, you draw other people into that story. And what often happens in those environments is that God uses you bringing people in to start writing a story in their life. Whether they had an assignment or not, we start to see God at work in a powerful way. We got to see this on display just a, a few months ago. Uh, my dad's been going to Nepal for some time, and we got to see uh, Jake go with my dad. And it was one of those moments where uh, this young man, 22, 23 years old, oh, they're sitting next to each other. I didn't realize that. That's a great, uh, I, saw, I saw, saw my dad. I didn't see you, Jake. You just kind of blended into the chair there. Um, <laughs> what was so exciting about this was to actually see this story that's being written uh, in my parents' life in kind of their um, they led a church for 34 years, and post-leading a church, God's been using them to bring the gospel and bring uh, training to area pastors in difficult-to-reach regions and hard parts to get to in the world. Well, that's a, a pretty unique assignment, but to watch them share that and start bringing other people into that story and to see something ignite in Jake has been one of the great pictures of what we're reading in Acts chapter 13, and that's something that we have a great desire for. What's happening in Yugo is so exciting just to see a, a group of people that for years have had this passion to go into Mexico and to be a, a blessing and starting to bring generations in. How many grandkids are going on this trip? Two this time. Two this time. Okay, last year it was a lot more. This year we've got two grandkids. But there are these families, these generations that are being brought into this story and this passion and this burden that, that's being carried. And th I could go through and see a number of you doing this very same thing. So as we think about this, I just want to encourage you. In the same way that we often say that the gospel was never designed to go to us, it was always designed to go through us, we would also say that whatever ministry God has asked of you, it wasn't just meant for you, it was actually meant for you to be training people up, apprenticing them, and equipping them to do the work that God's going to ask in their life. So always be thinking about this. God, what are you asking of me, and who can I bring? The second thing that we learn as we look at Acts chapter 13 is we see that the gospel goes out in resistance. There's constant resistance that we see as the gospel advances. There are a couple of examples here. Uh, we see on the island of Cyprus that there's Bar-Jesus, this Jewish magician, false prophet. When Paul and Barnabas have the opportunity to speak to the governor of Cyprus, the proconsul, this guy, Bar-Jesus, specifically contradicts them. He actually tries to counter-preach the gospel to Sergius Paulus. So as Paul and Barnabas are bringing this to him, and he asked for it, he called for the audience of Paul and Barnabas. He was intrigued by what he had heard they were saying, and then this other person is there specifically speaking against what they're bringing up. And I want you to notice something. Paul understands this to be spiritual warfare. Even though it's an individual person that's speaking against the gospel, the way that Paul responds to it, he says, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness. He actually talks about how he's making crooked the straight paths of the Lord. You are distorting the gospel, and he strikes him blind. It actually says, the hand of the Lord was upon him, and he went blind. Now, if we prayed for any of you and said that the hand of the Lord is upon you, you would be like, sweet. This is one of those moments where the hand of the Lord being upon a person is actually the, the discipline of the Lord. Striking him blind, and in doing that, Sergius actually sees the power of God at work. 
we see more resistance. When they're in the synagogue at Antioch, at first, as the gospel is being preached, the whole place is so excited to hear this message. So much so that they ask Paul and Barnabas to come back a second week. Please teach us again. And then in that second week, when actually the whole town shows up, the Jewish leadership is like, whoa, this is not what we expected. And they start to contradict Paul and Barnabas as they're preaching the gospel. I bring this up because I actually, I want you to know a couple of things. The first thing is the gospel is supposed to go out from you. Each and every one of us that's a follower of Jesus, if we've said yes to following Jesus, we've said yes to being preachers of the gospel. Now, maybe you're sitting there like, no, I didn't. And I'm saying, yes, you did. This is part of our discipleship in the way of Jesus. We're learning to obey all that he commanded. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Matthew 28, teach them to observe or obey all that I have commanded. And Jesus commanded us to preach. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. But he understood that there would be resistance every step of the way. So we have to understand that we are going to bring the gospel and it's going to be met by resistance. This is John 15, 18 and 19. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were not of the world... The world would love you as its own. I'm sorry, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. This is just uh, one of those helpful moments to know that if the world, as in the people around you that don't know Jesus, see you as aligning perfectly with their lives and the way that they're going, that's actually a problem. Jesus told us that being Followers of Jesus means that we would not be of this world. There would be distinction and difference. And the world does not like that distinction and that difference. It's difficult and frustrating. At its core, it's teaching people that there's a different way than the way that they are living, and that's going to come with resistance. Jesus said in Matthew 10, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Okay, so just think about that for a second. (laughs) Would you rather be the sheep or the wolf? (laughs) Most of us are like, yeah, I think I would choose the wolf. I would rather be predator than prey. Uh, But the idea of being a sheep, Jesus is saying, look, I understand I'm giving you a dangerous assignment. This is a word picture that every single one of them would have understood. There's a, a reality to us going out. And it's to go out and know that there is one that is after us. These wolves, the world, are trying to shut down the message. And Jesus' challenge, I know that I'm sending you into a dangerous assignment. So he says, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Be sharp and sober-minded with how you go out and be righteous and pure. This is not an opportunity for you to go in corruption, for you to go out and try and make disciples, yet your character is under question. That's not what Jesus is asking. He's saying, go out and be wise, but also be righteous, be innocent. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to the courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. All of that came to pass. We see this in Acts 9, 15, what was spoken over Paul's life. Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And then Jesus said, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. If your anticipation is that the Christian life will be easy and comfortable And that everybody will either respond positively to the gospel coming out of your mouth or you should not be preaching it. Those are uh, expectations that you should lay down. The Christian life is the narrow way. And it's the more difficult life. It's actually a life that is going to lead to some tension and some difficulty even in our relationships. And the call of God on our lives is to prepare for that. And to step into that. To experience suffering does not mean that you're doing something wrong. In a lot of ways with what Jesus is saying, it probably means that you're doing something right. 
And so we have to prepare for that. The gospel goes out with resistance. We also see that the gospel goes out through opportunity. The gospel goes out through opportunity. So Paul and Barnabas go to Barnabas' hometown, Cyprus. It's not a huge island. Uh, they go to this island, and they get a chance to speak to the governor. The proconsul invites the audience of Paul and Barnabas and asks them to preach him the gospel. It doesn't always happen that way, but there are times that it happens that way. We see it again in Antioch. Paul and Barnabas go to Antioch, and they actually get an opportunity there to preach. The local synagogue leaders say, oh, hey, <laughs> we have some visitors. Why don't you guys stand up and speak to us all? And Paul and Barnabas take advantage of the moment, the opportunity, and they start speaking. Both of these opportunities point to a passage that uh, Peter wrote in 1 Peter 3.15. Just to help us wrap our heads around this, it says, uh, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason, for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. I imagine you might have seen this passage before. If you've been around the church for any length of time, this is one that we point to often where Peter's calling on all Christians everywhere to be prepared. And I want to talk about what it looks like to be prepared to give a defense for the hope that is in us, a reason for the hope that is in us. Four ways to be prepared. The first is mentally, second is spiritually, the third is socially, and the fourth is to be opportunity prepared. I didn't have a, uh, a matching, whatever that is, tense. All right. First one, be mentally prepared. Be mentally prepared. There are going to be times where you are asked to share the gospel or you are given an opportunity to share the gospel. And part of our task as believers is being familiar enough with the gospel that we could share it with somebody else. When I preach, one of my hopes is that this isn't just inspiration, but that it's equipping. That you're taking notes that you're studying the scriptures on your own, that you're taking notes, things that will matter and affect the way that you, you preach the gospel. These are designed to be equipping times to prepare you and train you for those opportunities that you are given to preach the gospel, and you want to be mentally prepared for that. Right now, we are a culture that craves inspiration. We love TED Talks. We love, uh, we love listening to YouTubes and watching Instagrams that actually stir us up emotionally. We love inspiration, but there isn't a necessary aspect that is being equipped as well. And so when you study the scriptures, that's not just to study them to be motivated, to be stirred up or to be inspired. We actually study the scriptures to be equipped for every good work trained up to understand how we can communicate these things. Now, being mentally prepared does not mean getting a seminary degree. Sometimes we kind of distance ourselves and we think, okay, uh, I don't have that level of knowledge. I don't, I'm, not a, I'm not a scholar. I don't speak Greek. I don't read commentaries. I don't know those things. Well, there's, there's two things to say about this. First of all, that's never been the line of, of mental preparation. Anybody has the ability to be prepared at an intellectual level. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching. What that means is that you have the word of God and the word of God is useful to you for teaching. Not just for you to be taught, but for you to teach. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. So you have the word of God that you can use. And there's the challenge of First and Second Timothy to study the scriptures to equip even yourself. So I want to encourage you with that. The second thing is there's a massive amount of resources available to you to being equipped. And it could be as simple as you start by watching Bible Project videos and start to learn things about the Bible that maybe you didn't know before. It can be coming to whatever all-in Sundays we uh, provide because there are training opportunities that are all-in Sundays for you to be equipped and prepared and also listening to things that we teach on Sundays and in other places with that thought in your mind of, if given the opportunity, how would I share this? So that's what it means to be mentally prepared. Now let's talk about being spiritually prepared. Being spiritually prepared is the practice of sowing to the Spirit. 
Sowing to the Spirit. This is from Galatians chapter 6, verse 8. It says, For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Sowing and reaping is an agricultural concept, so it would have been very familiar to everybody there. This should make perfect sense to everybody, but I'm going to break it down for you. If you go into your backyard and plant carrots in the dirt, then a couple of months later, or however long it takes for carrots to grow, you go out there and you pull up those carrots. You're not expecting to see an onion. You are expecting to see a carrot. In other words, the seed that goes into the ground is the seed that you will reap later. It, it's in kind. What the, the scriptures are teaching us is that the things that we do today will yield fruit tomorrow in kind. So if today you are living a sinful life, that's sowing to the flesh. That means that tomorrow you will reap corruption. When you go to pull that fruit out of the ground, if you've been living according to the flesh and you go and pull that fruit out of the ground, it's going to be rotten. It's going to be corrupt. It doesn't magically show up as this beautiful fruit of the Spirit if you've been living sinfully. That's not how that works. But... If you sow to the Spirit today, you walk by the Spirit. You dedicate your life to pursuing the Spirit. You seek the things of God today. That yields fruit tomorrow that is in its kind. And from that fruit, you reap eternal life. Being spiritually prepared is knowing today that you're going to get opportunities tomorrow. And when I say today and tomorrow, I hope you know today is at the moment, the things that you do today matter for when those opportunities pop up tomorrow or the next day or the next month or the next year. Being spiritually prepared is doing the, the diligent work of preparing yourself in the spirit for whatever opportunities God might bring to you. So that means that you're praying for people. That means that you're praying for opportunities. That means that you're asking God to, to reveal things to you to equip you and to show you his way. It's tuning, everything we talked about last week, tuning your ear to hear his voice and disciplining yourself to know how to do that, learning how to pray for people and how to hear God's voice on their behalf. All of those things are sowing to the Spirit so that when the opportunities arise, you are ready. The third thing we'll look at is being socially prepared. Being socially prepared means that you're making a contract with yourself that in a social situation, Jesus wins. Sometimes we pull back from preaching the gospel out of fear of the cost of a relationship, what people might think of us, what the social cost might be to me if I am bold and I open my mouth up. Sometimes we could be we could be mentally prepared. We could even be spiritually prepared. And then we get into an environment where we have an opportunity to preach the gospel and the pressure or the cost of what it would mean to preach the gospel in that moment becomes so great, we, we back off. We back off. Part of being prepared to give a reason for the hope that we have is actually understanding that I am living a life that that this is going to cost. All right, uh, I don't know if you grew up, this is a very controversial question. I don't know if you grew up with spanking in your household. I was a spanked child growing up. Happy Father's Day. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> but I, I do believe it was very helpful. It shaped things. Anyhow, uh, there's, this, there's this line that came out of parents back in the day, and I'm not sure if it uh, resonates with you or not, but um, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. <laughs> All right, anybody ever hear that line from a, from a parent? Okay, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. Uh, and as you're sitting there as a child, again, maybe this is not your experience, but laying over your dad's lap, and he says that, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. Uh, yeah. yeah, right, dad, not a chance. <laughs> Part of the uh, discipline of being socially prepared is understanding that it's more important to the person that you're speaking to that you give bold truth 
and the name of Jesus to them, than even your willingness to pull back for the sake of peace in that relationship. Now, there's, there's a, a little bit of wisdom and strategy to that. Sometimes we have short relationships, and they, uh, they do come at a, a higher, faster cost, but sometimes we have long relationships. That there's some room for us to be able to speak into those places. I understand that at times you might be saying it wasn't the right time or it wasn't the right place, and that, that absolutely may be the case, but being socially prepared is, is you actually understanding that preaching the gospel comes at a cost. And it's preparing yourself for that cost. The last one is being opportunity prepared. This comes in two parts. The first is the practice of going through your days, asking the Holy Spirit to present opportunities for you to bless, to encourage, or to preach the gospel. So being opportunity prepared means that you're actually going through and proactively asking the Spirit of God to open up opportunities. And then the second part is when those opportunities are presented, you are bold enough to say yes, to obey. We've talked about that as radical, immediate obedience. If the Spirit says, go, this is it, I'm opening this door, we have prepared ourselves to say yes to those opportunities. And this is one of those moments where you make the decision before the opportunity presents itself. Holy Spirit, I'm asking for opportunities. If you give them to me, I am going to say, I'm going to run through that door. I'm going to say yes. Everything in me is going to want to say no, but I'm going to say yes to the opportunities as you present them. Being opportunity prepared means that we're going through the days ready, looking for, hoping for opportunities for us to preach. And the last thing that we'll see from Luke uh, in Acts chapter 13 is that the gospel goes out through invitation. The gospel goes out through invitation. We see it a few different times in this passage. We see Paul presenting opportunities. Uh, one of those comes in verses 30, or verse 32. Paul says, we bring you the good news. He's talking to the people at the synagogue, and he, they, they, already have the to- uh, uh, they already have the Old Testament. The prophets, the law, they have access to the word of God. And Paul's saying, I am announcing to you the gospel, the good news. This is a group of people that would already have considered themselves God's people. And Paul's coming to you and saying, it gets better. I have good news for you. And he invites them to hear and experience the good news. We see it again in verses 38 and 39. He says, let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, talking about Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. That's an invitation. That's an opportunity that Paul is presenting. We saw this a number of times. Jesus, in Matthew 4, 19, said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. In John 7, 37, he says, is anyone thirsty? Let him come to me and drink. Acts 2.39, when Peter was preaching, said the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. There's an invitation into the story of God. You are invited to experience what God has for you. See, these, these preachers of the gospel were going out and they were understanding that each and every person is being invited by God to experience his grace. As I was preparing for this, I, I honestly, I, I never know who's going to be in the room. We always have a decent idea of who our church is, but some of you are friends, some of you are relatives, you're, you're here from other places. You may or may not be followers of Jesus. Some of you have been coming to be a part of Anthem for quite a while, and yet you've, you've never said yes to following Jesus. I just want to take the last few minutes that I have this morning and extend an invitation for you to follow Jesus actually preach the gospel to you and invite you to respond. I just want to say a couple of things that I hope, I hope will be helpful. The first has to do with what you were created for. I imagine if you're here, even if somebody dragged you here, you're here, you have a basic belief that there's more to you than biological cells, just your cellular composition. That you have a soul. You've felt it, you've experienced it, you know there's something bigger than yourself. It doesn't just come through chance. It doesn't just come through evolution. It comes at the hand of a creator, one who designed you. 
And I want you to hear this. You were designed to be in relationship with God. Every single human being was. The Bible uses this crazy, amazing language that we're created in the image of God. That, that idea of the image of God is that we're made in God's likeness. We're made for relationship. We're made for community. You were designed for it. So if you're not in relationship with God, there's a reality that you are, are malfunctioning. And maybe you've felt that at times. Like you just, you feel a distance from whatever's out there, from God, from the spiritual realm. There's a disconnect. Writers have called it a, a cognitive dissonance. There's something in the world that's just off and not right. You've experienced it, you're aware of it, and it is a reality. You were made to be in relationship with God, and what happened is sin entered into the world. See, God created us with this ability to choose, this ability to, to make decisions. You're not just a puppet in some grand scheme. You are given autonomy. You're given the ability to interact with the world and to decide and to choose. That's a freedom that God made you with, and one of the things that... We, humanity, did with that as we brought sin into the world. Meaning there's God's way, and we've stepped outside of God's way to live a different way. And again, maybe you've felt that before too. The things that I'm living with, these things aren't right. It's not the way it's supposed to be. Most of us do that when we, when we lie or when we take something from somebody or we gossip about people or we're slandering the things that we think about people, we feel a degree of guilt inside of us. We feel that that's just at its core, not the right way to be living. And again, that's a picture of who you were made to be. You were designed by God to be in relationship with God, but there is sin in you. Well, God's desire was to reconcile his creation and himself. Now, word reconcile it's so relational. When there's a, a, a fight and you work on coming back together, that, that terminology is reconciliation. In the, the foster care world, when a, a foster child is reunited with their family, it's called reconciliation. There's, there's a, a picture that the, the world is very familiar with, that when a broken relationship is brought back together, it's called reconciliation. And that's the language that the Bible uses to describe God's people, his creation, being brought back into right relationship with him, it's called reconciliation. And the, the way that God gave us to do that is through Jesus. God presented Jesus to us that we might experience a pathway to reconciliation, a way to be brought back into relationship with God. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by him. And that's one of those hard and challenging things. You might look at it and just say, but there's billions of people around the, the, the world, and they don't all know Jesus, so why is there only one way? And honestly, the way that we see it in the scriptures is God's looking at it through a very different lens. He's looking at a world that has separated itself from him, that deserves nothing, the Bible tells us that the wages of our sin is death. The gap that we've created is, is death. God is holy and we are not. And God's looked at us and said, I'm not okay with that. God's looking at the brokenness of the world and he's like, I don't want it to end that way. And so he, he created a way where there was no other way. God created a way through Jesus that anybody that puts their faith in him, and it's literally anybody that puts their faith in Jesus, is restored into right relationship with God through what Jesus has done. See, when he died on the cross, that death was significant because it provided the forgiveness of our sins. Now, you might have heard me reading Acts 13 and Paul's preaching to the synagogue, and you're like, I have no idea what he's talking about. He just ripped off stuff about Abraham and Moses and David, and I, I don't even know the story. And you should know, you don't have to know the story. It's very important to know. You don't have to know the story. Paul was speaking to a Jewish audience, and so he connected with them on common ground. He told them a Jewish story to help them understand who God is. You don't have to know the Jewish story in order to know Jesus. And we know that because actually in Acts chapter 16, Paul will be in jail, 
And there's a jailer that doesn't know the Jewish story at all, but he sees a miracle and he asks Paul, what must I do to be saved? And Paul doesn't go, well, Abraham and Moses and David. He says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. He connects with him on the common ground of God sent you a savior and that's who you need to know. And so if at times you get overwhelmed by even a Sunday like today, I'm preaching things and you're like, I can't even keep track of what he's saying. You don't need to be overwhelmed by that. It can be as simple as pointing to Jesus and saying when we put our faith in him, that begins the work of God in our lives. It starts a relationship with him. And from there you can learn and you can grow and you can study and you can know. It's even good to study the Jewish story. It's like our origin story that we we never knew. My daughters are 13 and 7, and they, they've asked us if we could watch Star Wars. And so we're working our way through Star Wars. So we did. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. All right. Uh, so we did 4, 5, and 6, right? And then we went back, and we just watched episode 1 last night. Um, and, uh, man, I had forgotten the origin story. I'm like, Darth Vader was a virgin birth? I'm watching this thing, and just like, this is <laughs> crazy. But... Very far removed from the message, but um, now you're all wondering, like, do I need to go back and watch Jar Jar again to get the origin story? But you can go back, and, and for a lot of us, like, looking back on those moments and actually learning our origin story, it does help us understand a bit more about where we're going. But you don't need the entire origin story to know that Jesus is the way for you to be made right with God. What God has done is he has invited every single human being to experience his grace and to be made right with him. There's nobody that's exempt from that. And even if right now inside you're like, actually, I think I'm exempt from that, uh, respectfully, you're wrong. I mean, if, if this thing is God's word, If this thing speaks any truth at all, it says that God loved you so much that he gave you Jesus, that if you believe in him, you would never perish, but you would have eternal life. That is what this thing preaches, is that you are invited by the creator of the universe to be made right with him and to experience life eternal, John 3, 16, and life abundant, John 10, 10. He wants you to be able to go through this life with what he calls an abundant life. And we get that through, and this is wild. The minute you say yes to following Jesus, he pours out his spirit on you, and you are full of his life. It changes everything. Today, you can be right with Jesus. It doesn't have to be a tomorrow. It doesn't have to be a next year. It doesn't have to be a a get things cleaned up. It doesn't have to be a, a wait till you're older. All you do if you push it off is you delay the abundance of life. That's That's all you gain from pushing it off is delaying the abundance that God has for you. He wants to fill your life with fullness. And if you say yes to Jesus today, that fullness begins today. So if you're here and you have not said yes to following Jesus, you are invited to say yes to following Jesus. Not just by me. I'm just a dude on a stage. You are invited by your creator to be in a right relationship with him. And all I'm telling you is from what he gave us. So if you want to begin a relationship with God, It starts with this idea of faith. The Bible tells us that it's by grace you've been saved through faith, meaning God's grace and your faith. There's a partnership. God's grace has been extended. That's even something like this invitation is God's grace going out to you. It's God's grace just being poured out into this room. As we speak, he is pouring his grace out into this room. By his grace, the finished work of Jesus, the open hands of God. And through your faith, 
That faith is your belief that Jesus died for your sins. The repentance that says, I've been living the wrong way and I'll turn. And then the readiness to walk with God and allow him to correct you and move you towards the way of Jesus, the way that he has for you to live. That's faith. Your life is forever changed. So we're going to respond in a couple of different ways. For those that are followers of Jesus, we have practices of the ways that we respond to the, the scriptures being preached. We take communion to celebrate what Jesus accomplished. We give offering because it's part of, again, just the generous life of a believer. We sing songs. We love to just w- worship Jesus and praise his name. These are aspects of how we respond. But we also we have prayer teams that are here to minister. And here's just for those of you, if, if there's anybody that, that I was talking to and you're just like, yeah, this is it. I'm putting my faith in Jesus. Even as we speak, my faith is in Jesus. I want to ask you, while we're singing and responding and worshiping, to come and meet with our prayer team and just let them pray for you. Let them encourage you and minister to you today. If you've said yes to following Jesus, yes to faith in Jesus, would you let our prayer teams minister to you today? So I'm going to have the worship team come up. We're going to take a moment, and we're just going to respond in worship. And I would love for any, any of you, any of you at all, that have said yes to Jesus to come and meet with our, our prayer teams this morning. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today, and we thank you for the opportunity that we have to walk in you. Lord, I pray even now, if there's anybody out there that's just being stirred up by this grace, it's by grace that we've been saved, Lord, your undeserved favor on us to send Jesus to invite us to say yes to you. Lord, I pray for the faith that's being born in this room even today. Lord, that it would take root and do powerful things in this world. We love you and we praise you in your name. Amen.